December 24th, 1975, Peter Gibbs takes off in a Cessna F-150H. His body would not be found until four months later, and almost 50 years later, the circumstances behind his disappearance have yet to lead investigators to a final conclusion as to what happened. Welcome to More or Less Obsessed. I'm your host, and today we will be looking into the bizarre disappearance and reappearance of Peter Gibbs. I almost didn't record this episode after realizing how many other podcasts and social media accounts had actually covered this mystery. But this mystery has always had me interested for more, and I've been looking forward to creating my own episode on this for a long time. Let's begin with the two main people involved in this mystery, Peter Gibbs and his girlfriend, Felicity Granger. I would normally refer to people in my episodes by their last names, however, since both of these last names begin with the same letter, I'll be referring to them as Peter and Felicity as we get into the nitty gritty of this case. Peter Gibbs was 55 years old at the time of his disappearance. He was born in 1920 and served as a Spitfire pilot with the number 41 Squadron RAF, which is an acronym for the Royal Air Force Base. He served during World War II from January 1944 to March 1945. He officially left the RAF in 1954. He held a private pilot's license with about 2,000 hours of flying experience, but his license expired October of 1974 a little over one year before his disappearance. Felicity Granger was 32 years old at the time of Peter's disappearance and was a university lecturer. I want to say that she was a lecturer at the University of Glasgow. However, I couldn't find a source that would confirm that information 100%. The Inner Hebrides is an archipelago off the west coast of mainland Scotland, which includes the Isle of Mull. Peter and Felicity arrived by ferry on the Isle of Mull on December 20th, 1975, staying at the Glen Forsa Hotel. This hotel included its own airstrip called the Glen Forsa Airfield off the Sound of Mull. Peter was in search of an investment property and was considering the hotel. On the evening of Christmas Eve in the hotel's dining area, the two of them drank several glasses of wine and Peter had a shot of whiskey when he decided that he wanted to fly. Poor weather, including heavy cloud cover and a new moon, made the visibility nearly zero. The airstrip had no lights, which would make landing in these conditions almost impossible. Peter and Felicity spoke to the manager of the hotel, David Howitt. Peter was asked about his pilot's license, and he told Howitt that he had left his license behind. Peter was also quoted as telling him, I am not asking for permission. I just thought it was courtesy to let you know. This was simply planned to be a casual and spontaneous 10-minute flight. Around 9.30 p.m., Felicity and Peter made their way to the airstrip and to the borrowed plane. The aircraft was a red and white Cessna 150H with registration number G-AVTN. It was owned by a man named Ian Hamilton who purchased it September of 1975. Felicity walked to the edge of the airstrip with a single flashlight, and within 15 minutes began directing Peter to the runway. I have found sources that claim she had two flashlights in order to guide Peter during landing. The witnesses there that night have stated that the takeoff was smooth and a few of them commented on the skill level of Peter, considering the poor conditions. Felicity watched the aircraft disappear over the tree line, but as 10 p.m. rolled around, panic arose as Peter had not returned and there was no sign of him especially when the weather took a turn for the worse, and it began to snow. Worried for his safety, Felicity ran back to the hotel and told the staff that he had not yet returned. The staff contacted the police, who arrived and began their investigation. A search team was sent out to begin looking for wreckage. The belief at this time was that Peter had lost his direction with the poor weather and accumulating snowfall. By 10.45, it had been one hour since he had been seen, but the search team was called off due to the worsening conditions. The police finished their investigation of the airstrip, but found nothing suspicious. The following day, Christmas was spent with the police investigating the hotel and interviewing not only witnesses, but anyone staying at the hotel. 
Felicity was asked to recount her story from the previous night, starting at the beginning and including every single detail. The investigators were under the impression that two things had happened during his takeoff that were abnormal. He let his plane idle for, quote, a noticeably long time, about 10 minutes. He also turned his lights on and then off again, keeping them off for almost five seconds before turning them back on again. However, many people wonder why the police found this to be suspicious. It was winter, freezing temperatures outside, and it was about to snow. Letting the aircraft idle for 10 minutes isn't so out of the ordinary, as people do the same thing with vehicles to warm them up in the winter before driving. It's true that nowadays, vehicles don't require a warm-up for longer than about 10 seconds before ready to be driven. For modern-day aircrafts, this depends on the manufacturer, but most do recommend that the engines be warmed up to a certain temperature before takeoff to improve lubrication and reduce wear on the engines. As for older aircrafts, 10 to 20 minutes for a warm-up isn't out of the question. During World War II, for example, the Air Force would have 50-some-odd fighters and bombers on the ground, waiting for takeoff, each of them taking off one at a time. That would take at least 15 minutes to get through them all. The only issue that I've found with leaving an engine idling for that long would be overheating the coolant, but that doesn't seem to happen to most older aircraft. Searchers took the same flight path that Peter should have taken, but no wreckage or sign of an aircraft was found, including volunteers on foot. Over 200 people were involved in the search, but nothing was found. The military was involved as well, searching the ground and using sonar equipment on the sea floor with no signs of Peter or an aircraft. People living in the surrounding areas were also questioned if they heard or saw anything out of the ordinary or a possible crash, but nobody heard anything. Search radius spanned 30 miles, sonar was used, and people were continuously interviewed. Now for the reappearance. Peter's body was found on April 21st, 1976 by local shepherd Donald McKinnon, 400 feet up a rocky hillside lying across a fallen tree. After his body was found, the shock came from the location as he was only one mile from the hotel airstrip. Why didn't he simply walk back? The area was heavily wooded, but this location was searched on foot multiple times, and somehow nobody ever found his body. But the most surprising part of all of this was the state of Peter's body. It was decomposing due to being out in the elements, of course, but there were no signs of trauma or injury at all to the body, and no obvious cause of death. The question now became, how did his body get here? And where is the plane? Divers searched the surrounding waters again with no luck, no sign of wreckage, no sign of a fire, no sign of damage to the ground surrounding Peter's body. The only tree that was knocked down in this area is the tree that Peter's body was lying on. So this would not indicate a plane crash in this area. Where is the plane? There's no evidence of any wreckage in this surrounding area. The autopsy included no traces of seawater or marine organisms found on the body or clothing. Even after being exposed to the elements for four months, some trace evidence would have been left on his body. Toxicology results contained no amounts of alcohol, drugs, or poisons. Photographs taken of Peter's body include no broken bones and no sign of damage to the body. He was fully clothed and there were no tracks leading up to the body. Yes, it was snowing the night he disappeared and yes, four months had passed since his disappearance. However, somehow multiple searches of the area missed the body lying on a fallen tree. The only fallen tree. There were also no signs of wildlife, no scratches or bite marks on his clothes or body. Police began to wonder if the body had been placed there to make it look like he died of natural causes. And this is where the theories come in. The idea of a wreck in the ocean and Peter swimming to shore was dismissed due to the evidence. The possibility that Peter did not die the night he disappeared has been speculated, as per the zero trace amounts of alcohol in the toxicology report. 
Alcohol can stay in the body for up to six hours, in urine up to 72 hours, and on hair for up to 90 days. Even though the autopsy report did state that Peter had to have been deceased for at least four months, the possibility that Peter had been alive for several days after the flight has been considered. Unfortunately, there can be no definitive conclusion unless the plane is found. But something was found. In September of 1986, two fishermen discovered a red and white aircraft about a half a kilometer from the coast of Oban. Divers located the wreckage and claimed that the aircraft was a Cessna, with the registration number G-AVTN. I state claimed, and we'll get on to the reasons for that in a moment. The report itself states that there is a massive amount of damage to the aircraft, as if it suffered a severe impact with the water, including a large hole in the windshield. Both wings and landing gear were ripped off and the engine was missing. However, an interesting note is that the doors on either side were both locked from the inside, meaning the only exit from this aircraft would be through the human-sized hole in the windshield. And so, more theories emerged. Peter jumped from the airplane while it was still in the air. This doesn't account for one thing. Where is the parachute? Police in Oban dismissed this theory as Peter's body did not have injuries consistent with jumping from a plane. It was also unlikely that he would have hiked to the location he was found in the freezing conditions of that night. The next theory is that he was still in the cockpit when the aircraft landed in the water. Unfortunately, the likelihood of Peter dying from this crash is very high, as well as just falling unconscious from a landing like that. Considering the impact with the water was so forceful that it knocked the engine out and created a massive hole in the windshield, Peter then would have had to swim out of freezing cold water, make it to shore, and hike the distance to where his body was found. This theory gets dismissed by investigators. And so we move on. This was either the wrong aircraft, or if it was the right aircraft, someone else crashed it. This began to draw out an additional theory. Someone was in the plane when Peter climbed inside. This theory also does take into account the lights flashing on, then off, staying off for about five seconds before turning back on again. The possibility that Peter was not alone in the aircraft is there. However, how would this person even know that Peter wanted to fly that night? Or did he enter in on someone attempting to possibly steal the aircraft? Unfortunately, the photographs taken of the aircraft are so poor that they don't show any real information from the plane, including the registration number. And any attempts to retrieve this wreckage have not been successful. There are even more theories that unfolded in the years since, some of them including Peter knowing that this was going to be his last flight. Now, the theory that this might have been Peter's last flight does get thrown around a lot. And the theory states that Felicity was aware of this, which is why she only took one single flashlight, as per what this theory states. Even though, again, I have found sources that state she did have two flashlights for when he landed. Part of this theory does state that Peter decided against committing suicide as he got into the air, but due to the poor weather conditions, there was no turning back. There are many additional theories in this case, even those including aliens and UFOs. However, I won't be getting into any additional theories, as a lot of them don't take into account any of the physical evidence To this day, Peter's disappearance has never come to a defined conclusion. There are many questions in this case. Where was he for those four months? Was his body actually there? Was he kept alive for a period of time before he died? Where is the plane? But I suppose the biggest one that we have to ask ourselves, what did happen to Peter Gibbs?
Thank you for joining me on this episode of More or Less Obsessed. I've been your host, 